On this episode of Paleolithic Productions, I will be turning this raw piece of float copper into an atlatl point just like the people of the old copper culture did thousands of years ago. But before we get into the crafting process, let's discuss what exactly the old copper culture was. The Great Lakes region was home to a flourishing copper working culture for thousands of years. This archaeological culture is known as the Old Copper Culture. It existed from as far back as around 9,500 years ago to around 3,000 years ago. The oldest evidence comes from copper quarries, but the oldest reliably dated artifact is a projectile point from Wisconsin dating back to 8,500 years ago. Even though copper was likely used long before 8,500 years ago, this is still some of the oldest evidence of copper use in the world. The oldest copper working ever discovered dated to around 10,000 years old and was found in northern Iraq, though it was likely a pendant and not a tool. It would take some time to be utilized throughout the old world. The copper age did not begin in Europe until around 7,000 years ago. Ironically, Native Americans of the old copper culture were extensively using copper possibly a thousand years before Europeans. Though, these people were using copper in different ways than their European counterparts. In Europe, copper was mainly made from smelting copper-rich ore which was poured into molds to create tools. In the Americas, pure copper was simply found in the ground. The Great Lakes region has some of the most pure copper deposits in the world. This copper does not require smelting to be used. A nugget such as this one can simply be hammered into the shape of a tool. Hammering copper makes it harder, so cold hammering is difficult. In order to work it more efficiently, copper can be annealed by heating it up in the middle of a hot fire. This softens the copper, allowing it to be shaped considerably easier. I created a fire from old pallet wood and placed the copper nugget inside. The natives would have likely worked on multiple nuggets at a time, pounding one nugget as the other heats up in the fire. Even a quite small fire can heat the copper up enough to be pounded. The actual pounding is quite difficult and repetitive. Though the natives likely did not have welding gloves or long metal pliers, simple wooden tongs could have been used to handle the copper. With this nugget, I am just trying to flatten it, though this may not necessarily be accurate. Most nuggets would have been turned into square copper bars. These were essentially blanks which could be turned into a variety of tools. My nugget had some problems in its structure and some small pieces came off as I tried to flatten it more. The flattening became pretty boring and laborious as I continued on. Though each blow does move some molecules to the side, it is hard to notice that the blows are even doing anything when you're actually doing it. But regardless, you must continue. I heated this nugget in the fire for around 10 minutes before hammering it for about 5 minutes. I'm sure a hotter fire would have worked better, though this small fire was working alright. At one point though, I lost the nugget in the coals of the fire and had to take apart the entire fire. This made me wonder if the old guys would have lost a few nuggets in their fires. An archaeologist may be able to answer this question, though I have not found anything about it. I eventually found the nugget and kept hammering. After a few hours, I was left with a fairly small flat copper mess with some small copper pieces sticking out of the edges. After all was done, here is the final product for the day. I originally wanted to make a knife, but I was left with a blade blank that may be too small. I may either make an atlatl point or a small knife. I will decide after some more pounding. About a week later, I picked back up on the project. Though strapped for time, I resorted to using a metal hammer. Just imagine the hammer was made of copper or something. The people of the old copper culture certainly would have been able to make a hammer of some sort. They made all kinds of artifacts. Socketed spears, large knives, ulu knives, fishing hooks, axe heads, banner stones, and jewelry. It really is astounding how creative they were with such simple copper working methods. Some of their axes are even somewhat similar to the copper axes found in Italy. The same kind Utsi had. These kind of axes were casted though. The casting process requires a lot of complicated skills and resources. A large furnace had to be made typically out of clay or straw and then filled with charcoal, which also had to be made, and then people would have to manually blow air or pump air into the structure for quite a long time to reach copper's melting temperature, which is nearly 2000 degrees Fahrenheit or 1000 degrees Celsius. Contrast this to the Native American craftsmen who just had to pound a nugget for a few hours. It was still time intensive, but not resource intensive and it didn't require so much preparation and knowledge transfer. The Great Lakes natives really did have it lucky with their abundant copper. Extracting copper ore was accomplished with the use of hammer stones. 
These stones were pounded into the rock surrounding the copper to extract it. Heat was also applied to the rock in the form of fire and then it was doused in water. Extracting copper would have been hard work and the number of sites known says something about the capabilities of this society. The copper was extracted in a rough shape, though since it was so pure it could be broken up pretty easily and then further processed by pounding. In other places, such as Europe as previously mentioned, the copper had to be smelted as there was not many pure copper sources. I hope to find some of this native copper one day since I am from the Great Lakes region. The introduction of copper into the toolkit of the Great Lakes Native Americans revolutionized their technology. Before this development, stone was the main form of tool used for cutting purposes. Good napping stone is not very abundant in the Great Lakes region. Flint is available, and these people certainly utilized it to make great technology, but it is nowhere near as widespread as it is in the south or the west, where you can find many varieties of high-quality flint, and in the west, a bunch of obsidian. Copper as a metal has a number of advantages as opposed to the poor stone found in the Great Lakes region. It can be shaped in ways stone can't, it can simply be hammered back into shape once damaged, and it can easily be resharpened with minimal loss of material. The old copper culture made copper into fishing hooks, needles, awls, and other shapes which would be very hard or nearly impossible to make with stone. Copper fishing hooks were certainly very useful in the Great Lakes region. Hooks can be made out of organic materials such as wood or bone, but they are much harder to make and perform a lot worse. Copper harpoons were another fishing device utilized by these people. A wide array of knives, blades, spears, and axes were also made. Old copper culture points, spears, and knives appear to have been commonly hafted into some kind of organic handle, likely of wood, bone, or antler. Halfway through making this copper biface, if you will, I decided to turn it into an atlatl point with some sort of makeshift socket on it. Some copper culture points were fully socketed, but they mostly had simple conical tips which would have not been very good for hunting, though I think that's actually what they used it for. It's a little unknown in that regard. I do not intend to hunt with this point, but anyways, I wanted to make it sort of socketed and with a wide blade, so kind of the best of both worlds. For my design, I simply cut scores with a hacksaw and a bench, but this could have also been done with a sharp flake of stone, though of course this would have taken a lot of time. I hammered the base of the copper to form circular sockets to accept the dart shaft. Next, I sharpened the edges on this coarse cinder block. It certainly was not the best whetstone, but it actually sharpened the edge fairly well. This design looks odd because it is asymmetrical and does not look like the best way to haft a point, but many points would have actually have been hafted this way. I'm excited to see how it will perform and how the actual shaft will adhere to it. Next, I got a dowel and I sharpened one side of it to accept the dart point. I added on a bunch of pine glue to smooth out the transition because it did have some rough edges. I decided not to add any lashing such as sinew or gut because a lot of these points would have actually probably been hafted without a lashing of any kind. That's not to say that these points weren't, but personally I wanted to see how my pine pitch glue would hold up without sinew. Next I combined two dowels together with a slanted joint, pine pitch, and some sinew. This is an interesting way to combine two shorter straight shafts. A useful skill if you cannot find 7 foot long, perfectly straight shafts in the wild. I fletched the back end of the shaft with some goose feathers and some sinew and then I used the stone flake to drill out a hole in the back of the dart to accept the atlatl hook. The dart was finally finished and I took a break from hunting deer to test it out. And if you were wondering I was successful this year and now I have deer meat, hides, and sinew. So first I want to show you how big atlatl darts are. This one is around 7 feet or more in length and uh, a lot of atlatl darts were this way for ballistic reasons. I then just initially did some range tests to see how the darts would fly. The dart was definitely on the heavier side, I mean I'm not that familiar with atlatl darts and how heavy they should be, but uh, the feathers might have also been too small. Either way, it flew alright, but I think uh, if I were to do this again, I'd use some bigger feathers. The dart went pretty far, and the head stayed on it the whole time, and the glue was hardly damaged at all, which is pretty surprising. After a few more throws, I was pretty happy with the performance, and I decided I needed another test. The point is holding up quite well. Honestly, kind of surprisingly so, because I mean, it's just a thin piece of copper, but I guess it's, it's hardened because you're hammering it so much. But yeah, it's kept its shape. I mean, it's got some dirt on it right now, but 
Um, I kind of want to test it more, so I'm going to throw it at a tree to really see, uh, just really break it. I just want to see uh, how it will bend or if it will break or what will happen when it impacts like a really hard surface. So let's throw it at this uh, big tree right here. Don't worry, I don't. I think the tree's going to be fine. Well, I kind of imagine this is how it would happen, but the actual shaft broke. Turns out our little connection there wasn't uh, wasn't the best. I mean, it held through enough shots, so it was only a huge impact that broke it. But if we look at the actual uh, projectile, I mean, it held up again. Like, look, it went in at an angle and really bit into the wood. Oh, okay, never mind. Yeah, looks like the dowel kind of went through. But I mean, hey, that would still be a dead deer, maybe a dead bison, whatever. I guess they weren't really high hunting bison up here, but you can see the, the copper's a little bent right there. Yeah, interesting. I mean, it was worth doing. I can take this off and put it on another, uh, put another projectile if I wanted to, but yeah, so that's pretty much the video, guys. Thanks for watching.